Hello and welcome to this presentation on the 8th edition of the Guide and Environmental Impact. I'm John Bradfield, uh, Senior Director at ALAC International, and I'm pleased you joined us today to uh, discuss a very important document in the field of laboratory animal medicine. A uh, bit of background on me before we get started so you know who's sitting before the camera here. Uh, I'm a veterinarian uh, with a, a PhD in ex experimental pathology. I've been in laboratory animal medicine uh, and academia through my uh, whole career. Been associated with ALAC International for well over 15 years, doing site visits on the council accreditation and on the staff at ALAC for about three years. So that's a brief history of uh, my uh, career. And with that, I think we'll forge ahead and discuss this important document. Just a brief overview on the agenda here. We'll, we'll touch on the evolution of the guide and how it got to where it is today, touch on its influence, how it's used, and then dive down into the weeds a bit on uh, key points in chapters one through five, things that we deal with on a daily basis here at ALAC, and things that we see institutions deal with and sometimes challenged by with regard to this document and how to manage their programs. So the guide originally published in 1963, a good while ago. It was not entitled the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, but the Laboratory Animal Facilities and Care. Its focus in those days was primarily laboratory animal facilities and husbandry programs. And as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, the, uh, the revisions that have occurred over the years, and namely the growth in the document and its content and the scope of topics that it covers has indeed grown. When we look at the eighth edition, published in 2011, we see that it almost doubled in size. Uh, that's in part, I think, due to the 15-year time span between 1996 and 2011. The field of laboratory animal medicine and science grew tremendously during that time. So the guide had a lot of work to do to sort of encompass that growth and bring those standards into print. So. 154 pages of content in this eighth edition of the guide, and it has had a remarkable impact, I think, on how programs are managed and the standards by which we judge programs and their acceptability. If we jump back to the 96 guide, I think there was a watershed moment that occurred with the publication of that particular document, and that is uh, captured here, I think, on page three with this statement. It's relatively simple, but it really had a profound impact on the use of this document that continues today. And that is that uh, the guide charges the users of research animals with responsibility of achieving specified outcomes. But it leaves uh, how to accomplish these goals up to the user. In other words, a performance-based approach. Uh, that was a new concept in 1996, and it took programs and directors of programs and scientists a bit of time to adjust to this notion that there is now some flexibility in how we meet the standards rather than uh, focusing on exactly how uh, the standards are met in some sort of dictated fashion by the document. So that changed in 1996. Guy then also went on to say that performance goal places increasing responsibility on the user and results in interpretation. In other words, mainly the IACUC is tasked with interpreting the guide, the language of the guide. What does it mean? How do we implement those standards at our current institution and how do they apply? That also is a new concept and that flexibility was a bit uncomfortable for many programs. We certainly had to adapt how we um, use the guide and evaluate programs here at ALAC during that time. I'll say here at the outset that um, many of my remarks will be very ALAC oriented and that's both uh, inevitable and intentional, I think. It's inevitable because I have had so much experience of looking at programs through uh, ALAC and working with ALAC. But I would offer that ALAC uses this document in a way that no one else does. We take the standards of the guide and the language of the guide around the world as we accredit animal care and use programs. We live and breathe this language every day. And the Council on Accreditation has gone to great lengths to understand every nuance easier said than done. But I would contend that we use this document like no other 
it's a, a key part of what we do every day. And so much of what you'll hear from me is the ALAC perspective. I hope you find that of value. So this illustration on the slide here is meant to simply say that the guide is not a roadmap. It does not tell us how to accomplish the standards and how we meet those goals. It simply outlines the goals and leaves the destination to them up to us. That's an important concept. This performance standards requires judgment, professional judgment. It's a uh, coordinated effort among many people in the program. And it basically outlines the target or the goal. For example, the, uh, a very straightforward claim in the guide that cages should be regularly sanitized and cleaned. Seems like a very straightforward process, but it makes no mention as to exactly how we do that. You can invest in very highly technological cage washers, or you can do it by hand in a sink. Ultimately, how well it works is based on the professional judgment and the performance-based approach at the institution. Each can work e equally well, but obviously very different procedures. The guide is filled with that kind of flexibility, and that creates a bit of a challenge sometimes, even though we appreciate that of flexibility. In addition to this performance-based approach, there is language in the guide that um, offers uh, sort of additional interpretation about how it's used. Uh, this language directly from the guide states that the guide is intentionally written in general terms, that it requires professional judgment to interpret the language of the guide, and that IACUCs, namely, or ethical committees or ethics committees, oversight bodies, whatever you call that committee with a primary role of oversight in your institution, has a key role in the interpretation, implementation, and oversight, as well as the ultimate evaluation of the program itself. So the guide places the responsibility of implementation directly on the shoulders of the IACA. So this notion of performance standards and the fact that the guide is written in general terms can be both a blessing and a curse we find. Uh, sometimes we get, take great comfort in the fact that a document will tell us not only what to do, but how to do it. There's little room for interpretation in such a scenario and we may not like it, but at least we understand it and we do it. The guide is not that kind of document. It allows us to interpret and employ a variety of flexible measures to attain the goal. So that creates confusion. It creates debate, discussion. Uh, this creates um, a workload associated with implementation and understanding the guide. So I would offer that it's both a blessing and a curse. We like the flexibility that the guide offers, that we can achieve a goal in many different ways. But it also creates some consternation in that we have to figure out how to do that. I think with the advent of the performance standards back in 1996 and the language of the guide that reflected the performance-based approach, it, uh, it became a worldwide document. Um, a few of the language translations of the guide are listed here on the screen. They include uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Turkish, Russian, uh, French, German, Thai. So this document was translated back in 1996 to many regions of the world owing to its uh, written in general terms approach, meaning that it can be applied in almost any animal care program, hence its utility, hence its impact around the world. And part of the reason why ALAC uses it as one of its three primary standards as we go around the world to evaluate animal care programs. The eighth edition of the guide is well on its way to translation in, in many languages. Um, and so I think as time goes on, that number of languages will grow and the use of the document will also continue to grow around the globe. So it really has a worldwide impact. Well, let's move on and, and investigate some of the uh, details down in the weed sort of details in this document. Um, a general overview here of the eighth edition of the guide, the 2011 guide, uh, it's written in five chapters. Previous version was four. Chapter one introduces key concepts and sort of the fundamental foundation approach to the rest of the chapters, including animal care and use program, environment, housing and management, veterinary care and physical plant, with a pretty hefty list of appendices to support the language in the guide. Now, all this language is based on published data, scientific principles, but also on expert opinion and professional experience. 
these latter two aspects caused some consternation among the scientific community. Uh, the belief being that the, uh, the only relevant information ought to be uh, validated in the peer-reviewed literature. Well, the guide simply extends its recommendations beyond what may be in the peer-reviewed literature to include expert opinion and experience and judgment. Uh, this makes folks a little uncomfortable, but the guide uh, does this very intentionally, and that's probably another reason why it grew so much from the 96 version to the 2011 version in that um, as our understanding of animals and their biology and laboratory animal medicine grows and our professional experience grows, the document needs to reflect that. So chapter one here, key concepts. I'll touch briefly on this. Um, they're sort of broad brushstrokes of, of guiding principles of the guide. Most of us are very familiar with this, but um, I'll touch on them briefly and then we'll move on to the, the real uh, meat of the document. So applicability, the guide lists uh, uh, its audience. And in short, it, it basically encompasses everyone. Certainly eye cooks, veterinarians, investigators, primary audience of the guide, but also mentions the public. Um, we, we don't forget the public, but I think it's uh, appropriate. The guide mentions that everyone has a stake in the standards of animal care. And so the guide authors believe it applies to virtually everyone. For the first time, the guide uh, directly references the three R's. This isn't a new concept. The three R's have always been a background and, and a basis for the guide, but for the first time, the language includes the three R's and sort of reemphasizes the importance of our use of the three R's as we think about laboratory animal welfare. It defines the scope of the program, uh, the animals, their use, the policies, standards and procedures, and the personnel the facilities. It's a very broad definition and they do that intentionally because uh, the scope of the program often includes many different people with different areas of expertise. As a section on policies, I think that's important, um, particularly with regard to the IACUC. The guide cautions us to, for, particularly the IACUC, to provide leadership in the program and part of the way that the IACUC does that is through the development of institutional policy to implement the guide and uh, the IACUC's interpretation of the guide. And these are th all sorts of policies relative to the use of the three R's, to surger surgical procedures, husbandry procedures, and the like. So the IACUC's challenged with developing policies which provide guidance to the scientific community and the institution. Key terms. Uh, boy, there's been a lot of discussion about these key terms, particularly must, should, and may. People have counted them and compared them to previous versions, and there's so many uh, new musts that are now required in the guide, and there's hundreds of shoulds, and what do these mean, and how should they be interpreted? I think that's a healthy discussion, but I think counting them and getting wrapped up in the semantics may not be ultimately that beneficial. It, it is, certainly there are terms that we must pay attention to and incorporate into our thinking but they shouldn't become center point into how we interpret the overall language of the guide. So I've listed on uh, this slide here, many of the current topics in the, in the guide, the current version of the guide in chapter two, entitled the Animal Care and Use Program. Uh, this is a weighty chapter. It covers a wide variety in terms of breadth and scope of topics, both to ICOOK function, but also to occupational health and safety, and uh, a number of, of issues related to uh, reviewing protocols. So we'll touch on a few of these as we go through. Obviously, we don't have time to do them all. If we were to do this document justice, we would probably be here for a week, and you might not tolerate that time frame too well. So we're going to condense this dramatically down into a one hour or shorter presentation. So these, uh, I think, are some of the key areas that we at ALAC see programs um, deal with, struggle with. We get questions about these. And so I've highlighted these as uh, ones to cover in this presentation. The guide indicates now that there is an approach to program management, animal program management, which is collaborative or ought to be collaborative. And this is a, maybe it's not a new concept, but it's newly articulated. This collaborative approach involves the IACUC, the attending veterinarian, institutional official, 
and by implication, the scientific community or the PI. So there's a charge now for regular communication among the IACA, the AV, and the IO, institutional official attending veterinarian. And there's a, clearly a collaborative relationship that ought to be in place when managing the overall program. The guide clearly states this. We see the most successful programs embrace this notion, and when it works well, it benefits the program. Collaborations. We get a lot of questions about collaborations. Let's face it, animal use and research in general is global, and we collaborate with colleagues around the globe. In instances where animal studies involve collaboration, where animal use may include uh, animals that are off-site and the work is done at another location, the guide specifically indicates that in such cases, there should have be a formal written understanding, such as an MOU in place, which documents who has responsibility for the animals, who's responsible for their care, the veterinary care, who can make judgments about animal disposition, which I cook at which institution does the review and has the oversight. So the memorandum of understanding spells out all those details of day-to-day -day animal care and use that might slip through the cracks otherwise when the animal use is shared between two institutions. We look for that at ALAC uh, when we do site visits to ensure that institutions have thought about those sort of details when the animal use is shared in two different locations. There is a lot of content in this chapter two about occupational health and safety. Uh, too much for us to uh, go into much detail, but I will tell you that occupational health and safety findings are one of the top most cited areas on ALAC site visits. Uh, occupational health and safety is a broad program at the institution, likely. It involves many people in a variety of activities. These are difficult programs to administer, and hence, there's a lot of ways to misstep. We see this on ALAC site visits, and we return to the guide uh, for guidance about how we should manage and implement our occupational health and safety programs with regard to animal use. First among these principles is job risk assessment and hazard identification. By virtue of one's job, what is the risks, what are the risks that they are exposed to in the conduct of their job? Who does that analysis and what is their training and is that an ongoing or periodic analysis? Let's face it, the risks change, jobs change, descriptions change, and the hazard ID must change with uh, time. Second point that the guide makes is there, there ought to be a personal risk assessment portion of the occupational health and safety. This also should be periodic. You, you can't do it just once and call it good. Health professionals need to do a personal risk assessment for people with animal contact. How do you capture that group of people? How do you initiate their contact with the health professionals? These are all challenges that, we, that uh, many people face and how to accomplish, but the guide is clear in its uh, implication requirement that this be part of an OCH health program. It outlines control and prevention strategies, uh, a hierarchy for such things. So how do you protect personnel? Number one is proper facilities and equipment, proper design, proper HVAC systems, protective equipment, uh, biosafety cabinets and fume hoods and the like. How are those used and implemented? And they should be the first line of defense. Secondly, effective safety procedures and protocols. What are the procedures in place to manage dealing with hazards such as animal use or biosafety or chemicals or radiation? And then third and last, according to this hierarchy in the guide, is the use of personal protective equipment or PPE. We see a number of programs that use PPE first and uh, that can be a problem. So using the facility and procedures first followed by PPE is the outline in the guide, and that's what we look for in ALAC site visits. There should be health professionals associated with the program to provide medical services. Uh, this is not always the case. It seems uh, fundamental, but uh, not all programs have that, and, and yours should. Specific uh, language in the guide dealing with microbiologic hazards and, and how you should deal with those, and the guide specifically references the uh, BMBL in such cases. Uh, there's language in the guide about respiratory protection uh, and fit testing when uh, respirators are required for use. Uh, 
And finally, there should be a component of occupational health and safety training. Personnel should know the risks they're faced with, with the animals they use and the procedures involved and uh, the kinds of studies they're involved with. That training should encompass those facets. And the guide specifically references the BMBL in terms of microbiologic hazards, and we use that as a reference resource on site visits. So if you're using microbiologic hazards, you should be following the recommendations of the BMBL. ALAC also uses the Occupational Health and Safety in the Care and Use of Research Animals. This is an important document that goes into a lot of detail about how to set up and implement occupational health programs. Now, I've spent a bit of time on this topic. Um, I've really gone over it very quickly. But I did that intentionally because occupational health and safety is one of those areas that we see programs continually challenge to effectively implement. We spent a lot of time on site visits uh, evaluating these facets of the program. In addition to occupational health and safety uh, is the topic of IACUC function and namely protocol review. So if we look at uh, site visit findings, the second, really it's just about as, uh, as frequent as occupational health and safety issues, are issues associated with the IACUC or ethics committee relative to protocol review. Half of all IACUC related findings on site visits relate to protocol review or uh, ineffective or gaps uh, in protocol review. The guide has uh, additional language um, in this version compared to the 96 version on the kinds of things that IACUC should consider during protocol review. And there's a bulleted list in chapter two which lay the, lays this out fairly clearly, and I'll cover this briefly. This type here in red are, are the, the, is the new language in the 2011 version namely that there be a concise sequential description of the procedures involving the use of animals should be easily understood by all members of the committee that seems very straightforward but this can be challenging to uh, accomplish in some protocols they're complex um, and so sometimes the committee may not have a full understanding of the animal use if that occurs we think that's a problem in addition, uh, there is new language in, in this bulleted list relative to uh, group sizes and the number of animals required and the fact that uh, statistical justification is ideal when it can be done. Um, okay. In addition to that, there's a new bullet point on the impact of the proposed procedures on the animal's well-being. Uh, coined another way, this could be a cost-benefit analysis or like we use the term harm benefit, but that's considering the overall value and need to do the scientific investigation based on the impact of animal well-being and animal health. Uh, there should be description of surgical procedures and particularly descriptions of post-surgical and, and uh, post-procedural care for the animals, as well as a description for the rationale and anticipated selected endpoints. We believe this is both experimental endpoints described in the protocol as well as humane endpoints described in the protocol. We look very carefully at protocols to see if it uh, encapsulates these basic functions. I'll touch more on that later on. Also in this list, uh, long-lived species. Um, perhaps uh, their final disposition when the research project is completed um, and considerations for options for long-lived species. That's new language in the guide. And then a provision for the use of hazardous materials and safe working environment. That was there, but not in, in so many words in the previous version. In addition to that bulleted list, there's uh, a number of topics that the guide labels special considerations for protocol review. Uh, and again, we see this experimental and humane endpoints, uh, unexpected outcomes and the like. You can see the list here on the screen and I'll touch on a few of these because we've had Quite a bit of discussion at ALAC and the council itself, but also a lot of questions from institutions about how these special considerations are implemented during protocol review. What do they involve? I'll step back to the 40,000 foot level here. This is a sort of a ridiculous slide. It's probably too small for you to read and I list it here only for illustrative purposes. Um, in the US, this is a list of required elements of protocol review by the IACUC. Now, not all protocols will involve this entire list, but just looking at the number of bullet points on this list sort of underscores the complexity and the workload involved 
that eye cooks are faced with to follow these uh, tenants in the guide. I've also listed some from the animal welfare regulations here. But in the US, both of those apply and eye cooks are obligated to follow them. This is no small task. In fact, uh, before I go on to this next topic, I think that underscores one of the main take home points that I'd like to make in that when you think about impact of the eighth edition of the guide, I think the eye cook has to be foremost in your thinking. I contend that it is the single most impacted group of individuals uh, with this uh, revision of the eighth edition of the guide. The ICOC simply has a tremendous workload to implement all that's in this document. Secondly would of course be the investigator. So we have to keep these two groups in mind when we look uh, deep into the content. A bit about uh, harm benefit analysis get a lot of questions about that. Uh, equivalent term would be cost benefit. But it stems, we believe, from this statement here on page 27 of the guide that you see on the screen. The IACUC is obliged to weigh the objectives of the study against potential animal welfare concerns. While this is newly articulated in the guide, we don't believe this is at all a new concept. In fact, it's a basic premise on which IACUCs and ethics committees have been based since their inception. Uh, the guide simply now articulates that in uh, no uncertain terms that part of what the IACUC ought to do is consider the uh, potential harms or costs of doing the research against the potential benefit. Uh, this does not necessarily mean the IACUC do some sort of special analysis. This is inherent in the judgment and the careful analysis that any uh, protocol undergoes during review. And so it's not necessarily anything special but it's something that should be sort of in the back of our minds whenever we review protocols. And for protocols that involve the potential for pain and distress, this analysis gets even more important. And capturing the IACUC's consideration of these issues is often beneficial, either in the minutes or in questions back to the PI. But understanding that IACUCs do this is part of the site visit process. Humane endpoints. Uh, another topic in the guide that is now uh, more specific in terms of language. Critical aspect for protocols with a potential for pain and distress that should be clearly defined in the protocol, humane endpoints that is. Their determination should involve the PI, the veterinarian, and the IACUC before the study starts. And the guide says there are four critical criteria when uh, evaluating humane endpoints or establishing humane endpoints. Number one, a precise definition, as precise as possible. The old terminology of, say, uh, moribund may not meet this definition. That can be a vague term, and it means different things to different people. So describing uh, uh, clinical conditions, for example, that the animals will exhibit when they reach a humane endpoint is likely important. Secondly, Frequency of observations. How often will these animals be observed to see if they're reaching their endpoint? And what is the training of the personnel making these observations? Will they recognize the endpoint? And lastly, do they know what the required actions are when the endpoint is reached? These four critical areas are outlined in the guide. This comes directly from the guide, and ALAC looks specifically for these, um, and that IACUCs consider these during protocol review. This, uh, I have to smile a little bit whenever I see this topic because, boy, it has received a, uh, a lot of discussion and a, a lot of concern on, on part of the scientific community, and, and rightly so, I think. The, the guide has new language that indicates that whenever possible, pharmaceutical-grade substances should be used. I think, well, I know that we at ALAC, and, and I also suspect that the authors of the guide did, did not intend for that statement to include such things as test articles. By the very nature, there may not be a pharmaceutical uh, mass-produced product that can be used for a test article. By their very nature, they're in development. It's the point of the study. It's part of the variables that are under research. So it may not apply uh, easily, this requirement uh, for non-pharmaceutical or for pharmaceutical grade substances to test articles. But when it involves medications, particularly uh, anesthetics, analgesics, antibiotics, uh, things to promote animal well-being and welfare, um, pharmaceuticals ought to be used when they're uh, available. When they're not available or when they're inappropriate for use, the iCook is 
is uh, free to approve non-pharmaceutical grade substances. It's not that we must use pharmaceutical grade each and every time there's a product available, but we must consider them. And if they're inappropriate to use for some reason, that should be outlined in the protocol. And the iCook should establish that whatever product is used in lieu of a pharmaceutical is safe and effective. How is it made? Is it sterile? Is the pH correct? What's the shelf life? What are the storage conditions? Those are the things that the investigator in the iCook should consider when approving non-pharmaceutical grade substances. Again, another workload issue for the IACUC, but an important one. We get a lot of questions on this topic in Chapter 2, Post-Approval Monitoring, or PAM. Um, the, the guide says that the continuing IACUC oversight is uh, required, and it may help promote and provide opportunities to refine research procedures. I think both those things are true. Uh, this is a new term listed in the guide, although many of us are familiar with it for a long time now, but the guide now references this concept of post-approval monitoring. We get questions like, well, since it's now in the guide, is, is that required? Is there some sort of formal PAM program that our ICOC needs to institute in order to be compliant with the guide? We at ALAC believe that that's not the case, that uh, oversight can be accomplished in any number of ways. And having a formal PAM program simply may not be needed. It depends on the complexity and scope of your program. Um, it can be the semi-annual process. It can be the IACUC um, providing oversight through any number of mechanisms. Or it can be professional personnel hired to do nothing but post-approval monitoring on behalf of the IACUC. So it runs the gamut in terms of complexity uh, and, and I would recommend that you tailor this to your, the needs of your particular program. Smaller programs that use few animals in, in a very narrow area of research may not need a, a well-defined formal program of post-approval monitoring. Whatever you do, I would caution the IACUC to, uh, to avoid the gotcha approach when doing oversight in general and post-approval monitoring. It's not that we're necessarily trying to catch investigators going astray. Inevitably, protocol drifts occurs, or somebody may not understand the full content of a protocol, and uh, oversight visits can help catch those issues. But they should be done in the light of working with investigators to keep them in compliance with their protocols and the policies of the institution. And doing that in a friendly manner is a whole lot more effective than using the gotcha approach. So in summary on chapter two, I've listed um, what I think are the main responsibilities of the IACUC. And um, I intentionally chose this white flag waving image because in some ways, uh, this is a daunting task. Um, very few IACUCs are composed of people dedicated only to the IACUC. These are professionals who have full-time jobs. And to do what's required on this list on this slide is no small task. And I think we need to understand that. That's probably one reason why IACUC findings are the most numerous on ALAC site visits, is because the scope of work by the IACUC is tremendous. OK, let's move on to uh, environment, housing, and management. Uh, another weighty chapter in the guide. This is chapter three. It covers a wide array of topics. Uh, a lot of details here about how we care for animals, basically describing husbandry programs and their overall management. I'll touch on a few of these topics here as we move through Chapter 3, but certainly not all of them. Table 3.1, I think, in some ways, it may be the most misunderstood table in the guide. Uh, this table lists recommended dry bulb temperatures uh, for most common laboratory animal species. When you look at the values in this table, there is a very wide range. And some uh, interpret this table meaning that if, a, if the day-to-day -day temperature variation occurs anywhere within the range, if you look at mouse, rat, hamster, gerbil column, 20 to 20 degree, 26 degrees C, 68 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a very wide range. Um, so some folks interpret that, that as long as the temperature is anywhere within that range, we're okay, we're meeting the standards of the guide. And we believe that that's a misinterpretation of this table. This table is intended to provide guidance on where you establish the set point for your temperature settings in your animal rooms. 
This is also language from the guide, and it specifically addresses this issue of uh, the Table 3.1. They're broad and generally reflect tolerable limits, not day-to-day -day variation allowance. Um, animals should have uh, adequate resources for be behavioral thermal regulation, i.e. bedding or nest building, and temperatures should be selected and maintained with minimal fluctuation near the middle of these ranges. That's the ALAC approach. So you should establish your set points uh, where the science and the animal biology dictates and minimize the uh, fluctuation of day-to-day temp -day temperature fluctuation around those set points. The guide later in Chapter 5 indicates that plus or minus 1 degree C or 2 degrees Fahrenheit is an appropriate range of fluctuation. That's a pretty minimal range, certainly much narrower than as reflected in Table 3.1. Maybe the most talked about uh, topic in the in the eighth edition of the guide. Uh, certainly, the Council on Accreditation is still discussing the nuances of social housing, and I think many programs are too, depending on the species of animal. Uh, this is a busy slide, but focus on the type in red here, and that the guide uh, indicates that we should account uh, for the animal's behavioral needs, their social needs. They should be housed in stable pairs and groups of compatible individuals, a should word again. There should be appropriate social interactions and single housing of social animals should be the exception. So um, I've sort of capsulized there a lot of language in the guide that describes its, its requirement and approach for social uh, needs of animals. We get a lot of questions about this, and, and basically the ALAC position is that um, social housing should be the default. If animals can't be socially housed, either due to veterinary reasons or needs of the science or because they're incompatible, fine. But those instances should be reviewed and documented by the IACUC. In other words, single housing should be intentionally considered, and the IACUC should uh, give careful weighty consideration to the social needs. If they can't be met and the animal singly housed, then that is allowable as long as the IACUC has fully considered it. We move on to environmental enrichment. Um, and this is fairly straightforward as well, but in, in enrichment programs, the guide says should be reviewed by the IACUC, the researchers and the veterinarian on a regular basis. So this is a periodic review, both to ensure that it's appropriate as well as effective, should be updated as needed as we learn more about uh, appropriate enrichment strategies for animals and people in the program should be uh, at least uh, trained or well-versed or understand the scope of the environmental enrichment program and what it entails. Specific points that we consider here at ALAC is that the uh, all animals in the program should be considered when developing an environmental enrichment program, not some animals uh, excluded and including others. It should be afforded to all animals in the program, at least the consideration for environmental enrichment. It should be uniformly in, in, implemented across the program, knowing that in some cases, environmental enrichment may impact scientific outcomes and may be inappropriate. In such cases, enrichment may be withheld. Um, this also should be a consideration of the IACA. There is a need also, we think, to consider personnel safety and biosecurity with enrichment items, um, the, the, hence the need for ongoing review and assessment. Initially, this uh, received quite a bit of discussion, this issue of cage and pen space. We've, we've seen uh, some issues uh, since we implemented the use of the guide on ALAC site visit, but it's proven not to be that tricky for institutions. Um, many people turned right to tables 3.2 through 3.6. These list the various species and the recommended starting points for cage sizes. And there was some new language in these tables with regard to mice and rats with litters and non-human primates. We should keep in mind that these tables by their very nature are engineering standards. They list recommended uh, starting points. The guide also has a, a whole host of performance standards or criteria listed in the guide in the text. And so we would caution uh, programs to read uh, this section on cage and spin, can, pen space very thoroughly because there's, the guide has a lot to say other than just the numbers and engineering standards in those tables. So the, in, in a, briefly, the performance standards described in the guide, uh, one here on the page, that animals should be um, able to make natural postures and postural adjustments, 
should have ready access to food and water and comfortably rest away from areas soiled by feces and urine. Performance criteria. Socially housed animals should have the ability and enough space to escape aggression or hide. Cage height should take into account postural adjustments and clearance uh, from, from structures within the cage and particularly the cage ceiling. And final example here is uh, particularly with regard to rodents, uh, that there should be sufficient space to allow the pups to develop to weaning without detrimental effects to either the mother or the litter. These are performance criteria that institutions should consider when establishing how to use the cages that are in place. Let's focus less on the size of the cage, that's only one aspect, and focus on the, um, the nature of how that space in the cage is used. Still in chapter three here, uh, monitoring effectiveness of sanitation. I mentioned a, at the beginning this issue of uh, washing cages and that you can do this in any number of ways, and that's true. But you should establish a mechanism by which you assess the effectiveness of cage sanitation. And the guide has clear language on things to consider when doing that. And we see uh, this a lot come up during site visits as to how you know your cages are clean, whether you wash them by hand or in a cage washer. And sometimes institutions don't know. They don't have systems in place to assess effectiveness of sanitation. Some say, and I agree, that the cage wash is the heart of the animal facility. Because if it is not working effectively, you can get spread of disease, which impacts animal health and scientific outcomes. So it's a critically important part, and you should know whether or not it works. So establishing some method, maybe even a microbiologic method, is recommended by the guide here to establish that your cages are clean. Quickly moving through veterinary care here, and then the final chapter of, of physical plant, um, I'll touch on a few more topics. We're in chapter four now. Um, these are many of the main topics that you see in chapter four, and I'll cover uh, just a few of those. I, I think of all the chapters in the guide, this one, I would argue, changed the least um, in that many of these concepts were in place in the previous version of the guide. I will cover, though, the role of the attending veterinarian. Um, ALAC does site visits around the world, and, and we understand that the role of the veterinarian in the animal overall animal care and use program varies according to region and even country. In the U.S., there's a statutory requirement for an attending veterinarian and their responsibilities and their authorities. This doesn't exist in other countries. And so ALAC uh, really combed through the guide carefully to determine what the guide says about the responsibilities of the attending veterinarian. So this next section will highlight those areas and what ALAC looks for in the scope and breadth of the veterinary care program. Oddly enough, or interestingly enough, many of these statements come from Chapter 2, not in Chapter 4. But again, this is the scope of the program outlined in Chapter 2, and this is where you'll find much of this language. So on page 13, you'll see that the veterinarian is tasked, along with the IACOC and the IO, for oversight responsibilities. Again, that collaborative approach. While the IO bears ultimate responsibility for the program, it is really a shared day-to-day -day management responsibility among the IO, the attending veterinarian, and the IACO. So the attending veterinarian has day-to-day -day program management responsibilities. Program needs should be clearly uh, and regularly communicated to the IO by the attending veterinarian. So this need for collaboration and namely communication. Ultimately, the guide says on page 14, the attending veterinarian is responsible for the health and well-being of laboratory animals. I don't think anybody would debate that. But in some regions of the globe, uh, veterinarians uh, may or may not have such direct impact on the health and well-being of animals. We look to see that veterinarians do have that impact in programs that we accredit. Continuing on this topic, uh, the guide has a statement that indicates that the AV should oversee other aspects of the program. In other words, not just be restricted to veterinary care, but also encompass husbandry programs, um, housing of animals, um, we were talked about temperature and set points. The veterinarian is often involved in establishing those. So the scope of expertise required of veterinarians is really quite large. If there is no full-time veterinarian, the guide says that a veterinarian should be available at appropriate intervals to meet the needs of the program. So how often that consulting veterinarian visits depends on the program itself. But it should be frequent enough so that veterinary care is effective and fully implemented.
If there is no full-time veterinarian, someone at the institution should be designated with assigned responsibility for daily animal care use and facility management to coordinate with that veterinarian to establish visits and veterinary care, emergency care, and implement the overall program of veterinary medicine. With regard to training, I'll just touch on this. The guide has some statements that the veterinarian must have experience, training, and expertise necessary to evaluate the species or the well-being and health of the animals used. That's a must statement in the guide. So we will look to see that the training requirements of attending veterinarians are in place when we do site visits. Additionally, veterinarians should also have experience in training in laboratory animal facility management and administration. They may also need expertise in a whole variety of topics. So we can see that the guide tasks the attending veterinarian with quite a number of, of uh, responsibilities. So we look to see that programs have recognized that and uh, placed the veterinarian in a position of authority to meet those responsibilities. Finally, in chapter four, there's some verbiage about the role of the attending veterinarian. The veterinary care is essential, oversight of the animals and their well-being promoting animal well-being at all times, monitoring animal well-being at all times, and implementing a high-quality care and ethical standards. So that comes from chapter four itself, the, the chapter on veterinary care. Part of protocol review, as well as day-to-day uh, -day management of animals that are on study involves the, uh, the prevention or treatment of pain. The guide says it's an integral component of veterinary medical care. We at ALAC uh, believe that, and we look to see that the veterinarian is closely involved in pain management, uh, recommendations for appropriate pain medications, anesthetics, and analgesics. Um, the guide gives a nod here to preemptive analgesia and this notion of wind-up and preventing wind-up so that we prevent uh, animal pain. This is a basic tenet of the guide with res regard to animal pain, and it's a it's a core value uh, that, that ALAC uses when we evaluate programs, and that is that the use of anesthetics and analgesics is an ethical and scientific imperative. And so we place a lot of importance on evaluating programs with that in mind. There should be training and um, uh, understanding and awareness of recognizing clinical signs and specific species, and this runs the gamut, and it can be quite different from species to species. And, uh, veterinarians know this, but another core principle that the guide has been based on for a number of iterations, but certainly in this most recent one, is that unless the contrary is known, if a procedure would cause pain in humans, we assume it causes pain in animals. And it is on that premise that we evaluate protocols, establish pain relief uh, regimens, and implement them to make sure that they're followed. Likewise, the guide addresses distress, and it defines it as an aversive state in which animals fail to cope or adjust to various stressors. Im implementation of clear, appropriate, and humane experimental endpoints uh, is critical, both to limiting distress as well as pain. And this gets back to uh, those four key principles of establishing humane endpoints, particularly for protocols that involve the potential for pain. Lastly in this chapter uh, is the uh, topic of euthanasia. Um, the ALAC Council has adopted the AVMA guidelines on euthanasia and the most recent iteration of that, so you should be very familiar with the details of that. We have had a lot of questions about um, the AVMA guidelines and how they're used, and particularly about CO2 euthanasia for smaller species. And we find this, this uh, line in the guide that says, unless a deviation is justified or scientific medical reasons, um, methods of euthanasia should be consistent with the AVMA guidelines. Specifically with regard to CO2, should use uh, sources from compressed gas cylinders, a displacement rate of 10 to 30 percent volume per minute, avoid pre-filled chambers, and a method to verify death. Those are key points um, outlined in the AVMA guidelines, and those are things that we look for when we look at procedures for the proper euthanasia of animals. Last chapter is a, also a weighty chapter, and it covers physical plant. There's way too many topics for us to address here, but I'll choose a few, and then we'll wrap it up. 
This notion of uh, animals in laboratories, uh, we call those satellites, when animals are maintained outside the animal facility, um, we expect that the basic overall conditions in those satellite facilities uh, meet the same standards as those required in the animal facilities themselves. And the guide lends credence to this notion with this statement on the screen. So wherever you're housing animals, particularly outside the animal facility, you have to think about the things that you normally would in the animal facility. Um, security, uh, temperature, HVAC, uh, procedures for sanitation, transport back and forth to the satellite facility, occupational health and safety issues with regard to animal allergy. All those facets that you would think about in the animal facility also apply to satellites. One of the main areas in, in Chapter 5 that we see programs struggle with is HVAC system function, and it's complex. These are expensive systems. They're often uh, delicate systems. They can be fragile and uh, difficult to balance and maintain. So we see programs struggle with those. But with regard to HVAC, uh, we expect that temperature control be paramount because when temperature control is not good, animal well-being suffers and maybe even animal dust, deaths result. There should be high temperature fail safe such as reheat coils that fail in the closed position a very effective monitoring of the environment, uh, the animal room environment, the temperature, the humidity, air pressure differentials, uh, alarm set points so that uh, when uh, temperatures get out of alarm, appropriate actions can be taken. Um, also important with HVAC system function is uh, ventilation, airflow direction, um, and then assessing uh, HVAC function periodically. At AWAC, we require this every three years. Um, and also that the HVAC system function at some minimal level, um, even during power outages. I'll note here that uh, when we analyze the kinds of disasters reported to AILAC and, and where they occurred, is it flood, is it fire, is it hurricane, what is it? We note that over the last five years, 71 of the uh, disasters, 71% of the disasters reported to AILAC were the result of HVAC or uh, some other system malfunction. So far and away, the biggest category of disasters that impact animal welfare occur within the facility itself, namely that HVAC system. So whatever attention you pay to maintaining that system is, uh, is, is, is good and, and well-founded. Rack washer safety, the guide says that we should consider personnel safety in these pieces of equipment. They're dangerous and sometimes even deadly. At ALAC, we have uh, three, four basic tenants to uh, implement this uh, safety, and that is ease of egress, a device inside the chamber that will stop the flow of the water, the energizing device, and that people be, pers uh, be well trained in the training devices themselves. Lastly, that the uh, safety features on the machine be labeled with signage that's legible, signs that indicate where on the door to push to open it from the inside, not on the hinge side, for example, um, a, a tag on the cable to turn off the, the water in the chamber should be a sign identifying that. So those are the key points that ALAC looks for to uh, meet this standard in the guide. I mentioned the environmental monitoring, but this is key. Um, automated systems are recommended. Uh, this is a statement from the guide. Uh, they should function basically 24-7, 365, weekends, holidays, middle of the night. You can do this with manual methods, and some small facilities manage to do this, but it's challenging uh, to do this manually, say with personnel walking through the facility at off hours. It's uh, fraught with problems and difficult to achieve. So automated systems are recommended. Uh, there should be uh, an appropriate call-out mechanism to warn personnel that issues arise at any time so that appropriate action can be taken. So where you set your alarm set points is important. The ability to notify personnel, continuous coverage, and monitoring temperature and conditions at the room level are all key features we look for. Not monitoring at the building level, but at the room level where the animals are. So with that, I think we'll uh, summarize and then try to address a few questions. So the guide's intentionally written in general language. It uses performance standards and allows us latitude on how we implement. This is a little uncomfortable for us sometimes because we have to understand the guide. We have to be 
smart about what the content of the guide is and what the language says. And we have to implement that correctly. This is, has a significant impact on IACUCs, namely, and investigators as well. If IACUCs continually over uh, interpret requirements of the guide, this can really increase um, regulatory burden at the institutional level. And we see this all the time. So IACUCs need to be really smart about what the guide says and when the guide gives us flexibility. And we should use that flexibility to the benefit of the program. If we look at those key facets of IACUCs, we, we think about protocol review, that it be thorough and detailed and careful, that there be some mechanism for program oversight, that this is ongoing, whether it be a semi-annual process or a post-approval monitoring program. There should be a robust occupational health and safety program. If we look at environment and housing and management, social housing, environmental enrichment, and cage space are key issues for consideration. The IACUC should be involved in making those policies and decisions about those key aspects of the environment. Veterinarian has a multifaceted role, particularly important as we go around the globe, and specifically managing pain and distress. We just completed the physical plant portion, HVAC, 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 because it has such profound impl imp implications with regard to animal well-being. Satellite management and cage and rack washer safety are also key, key aspects to that physical plant. With that, I will wrap up. I think we're um, pretty close to the end of our time, but I'm going to see what sort of questions we, we have and uh, scroll through these. Here's a question about uh, CO2 euthanasia and the, whether or not ALAC requires the CO2 chamber to be physically evacuated uh, before placing other animals in the chamber. It's a good question. And I'll caveat, uh, make a caveat point here at the beginning that the uh, ALEC Council is still working through some of these fine details. So you have to stay tuned on this one. I think the answer of evacuating the chamber depends on how it's used, uh, how much time between batches in euthanasia. So if the top was off the chamber and there's a potential for a lot of room air to be mixed with the CO2 in that chamber, effectively evacuating it just by normal usage, Maybe you don't need to evacuate that chamber. On the other hand, if the next batch of animals is going in immediately after the first batch was removed, maybe evacuation would be required. The point is not to exceed that 10 to 30% displacement rate recommended in the guidelines. Those were recommended based on peer-reviewed literature about when pain and nociception occurs at around that 30% rate. So exceeding that may induce animal pain and distress. Is it possible to approve the use of sodium pentobarbital uh, for all studies in one organization? You know, this is an interesting one because this drug has essentially been made unavailable due to its expense. OLA has recognized that, and I think the USDA as well. And I think that's a decision that the IAC can make. If the drug is so expensive as to be rendered virtually inaccessible um, and, and sodium pentobarbital is required, for the conduct of certain procedures, then alternatives can be made available. And the IACUC could establish a policy on how that can be done effectively. Guidelines for what to use, how to use it, how to prepare it, and how to make sure it's safe and effective. There's a question here, I think, uh, can you restate the four criteria protocol review? that ALAC specifically looks at and what page in the guide it may be. I think this might refer to humane endpoints. I'll test myself here and see if I can recall them off the top of my head uh, if I understand the question correctly. Number one consideration is a precise definition of the endpoint, what the animals will be experiencing and the clinical signs that will be observed, precise. Number two, what's the frequency of observation of those animals? As they get uh, more painful or sicker, the frequency might need to increase. And so discussions like that would be important. The training of personnel that will be making those observations of the animals. What do they know? Can they recognize the endpoint when they see it? And finally, what is the action that they are required to take when, um, when the endpoint is reached? <clears throat> 
bear with me while I look through the question list here. I'm trying to uh, scroll up for additional questions. It, I, I'm thinking this question might also pertain to CO2 euthanasia. I'm not sure, but the question is if it is necessary, is it necessary to put only one animal in the cage and what do you recommend? The AVMA guidelines uh, are not real specific on the number of animals to be placed in a euthanasia chamber at a time. I, th I think we could all agree that placing too many animals in the chamber would be problematic. I think more germane than, well, as at least germane to the number of animals is um, mixing animals that may be unfamiliar, particularly with rodents. Uh, there can be aggression and fighting and tremendous distress associated with mixing batches of rodents in that CO2 chamber. Certainly having enough space so that each animal has floor surface area and, and that they're not overcrowded would be critical. So considering overcrowding, however you define that, as well as avoiding mixing animals of different sources that might be f unfamiliar with each other, inciting fighting and aggression. Uh, those are key points to keep in mind. Um, how exactly you do that um, it was probably an a institutional decision, but it's something that should be considered. We would not say that only one animal in the cage at a time would be required. But again, the caveat is that the council is still discussing the finer details of AWAC's expectations there. So stay tuned for the, um, what we look for on CO2 requirements. How do you decide when it's appropriate time to do post-approval monitoring and who should be in charge of it? Well, the guide uh, places that responsibility ultimately on the shoulders of the IACUC. The IACUC is tasked with program oversight. How you accomplish that oversight uh, does not necessarily mean that the IACUC members themselves must do it. Typically, they'll involve members of the veterinary staff, maybe the operations manager and other people very familiar with the facilities, as well as sometimes uh, dedicated staff to do nothing but post-approval monitoring. They can act on behalf of the IACUC, provide reports and information to the IACUC, but ultimately, it's the IACUC that's responsible for doing that. The frequency of that may depend on the nature and the work of the studies involved. Uh, the, the, the more invasive or tricky the studies are, perhaps the more frequent visits ought to be. Surgery, for example, if, uh, if there's a laboratory doing surgery, you might visit that lab more frequently than if animals are simply brought to the lab, say, for blood pressure cuff measurements uh, three times a week. There's a difference in those kind of procedures and a frequency and a hierarchy of when you visit them might certainly be very appropriate. I think that brings us to the, uh, to the end of our time. And so I, I, th I think it may be time to, to sign off. I appreciate your attention and your attendance. I hope uh, this brief overview of the guide was helpful and thanks for joining us.